before we kind of jump into media suite, let me give a short introduction of, of Jennifer. Um, Jennifer has been a faculty member at INSEAD since 2011. Um, she's truly a star. Um, she's been tenured a few years ago. She has in our field or in her field, the most prestigious journalist, probably the Aitman Administrative Science Quarterly. Very few people ever publish in their journal. Jennifer has managed to publish in their journal three times, including one single author papers. To kind of give you a feeling for how special Jennifer is, um, INSEAD typically never hires its own graduate students. Despite producing excellent graduate students, we almost never hire our own graduate students. In Jennifer's case, we made an exception and said we definitely have to have her back. And um, I don't think we ever regretted that for a single minute. So we are very, very happy to have educated her and to benefit from everything she brings. Beyond all her, she's an award-winning researcher. She's an award-winning teacher. Not only has she won multiple awards, but the people who have taken over her classes have actually won awards. So she's really somebody who invests in the success of others, makes other people successful. This book is in no way an exception to that. Very much she helps other people to succeed. One thing on a personal note I would like, like to add, Jennifer is not only a star in the sense of, Jennifer is not only a star in the sense of making being herself very successful and making others successful. But I would say she also makes INSEAD a home. A lot of, we have a lot of alumni on the call and a lot of people might actually say, you know what, INSEAD is a place I also kind of feel home when I come to. And Jennifer is somebody who does this for students, is somebody who does this for her colleagues. So um, while we are hosting her today, in many ways, I think she's constantly hosting us. So thank you so much. Good <laughs> to have you, Jennifer. Thank now, you, honey. I'm gonna hire you. Uh, all my introductions. Now live up to the expectations. Jennifer, <laughs> um, the book is right behind me, um, Couples That Work. Um, I also have a second copy in, in front of me. Um, it's Couples That Work. Um, I think a lot of us come to the point where we realize, you know what, it's not only that I'm struggling in my career, but that my partner plays a role in my career. I might also struggle in my relationship. I wonder what inspired you to write the book. It's a big endeavor. It's a big research endeavor. It's obviously a big endeavor to write a book. Um, what inspired you to do it? I mean, so really going back to the beginning, we're talking more than 10 years ago now. So I'm someone who researches a lot on leadership and leadership development and leadership in crisis. And more and more, I was hearing leaders say to me, well, you know, if you really want to understand my career, you should talk to my partner. And um, being in a dual career couple like you are as well, Henning, we, we both are, I sort of knew in my own skin, these connections between the two. And as every good scholar does, when I hear something like that, I'm like, I'm going to go to the library, look who's written about this, and look who's done research, and really went to the library and found nothing, really found, so, you know, magazine articles and things with famous people pontificating, but really no research at all in this area. And so I sort of got fascinated on the, the connections between our careers and how we can make each other and how we can also break each other in couples and how I think, you know, I always think there's kind of two approaches to this. One, people say, I, I really want to keep my, my life and my work separate. And while that may be a great wish, it's just unrealistic, right? There's so many interdependencies. So that was really the spark for looking at, well, what are they and how can we manage them and how can we negotiate them in a better way? So the book is interesting, right? The book is really in many ways like a career book in the sense, right? You see the book is, I felt like it's two in one because it's a little bit of a book like, how do I get my career to work and how do I get my partnership to work in that sense? Um, what would you say is kind of the biggest impact how partners help or not hinder partners' career, so to speak? There are plenty of examples in this, but I, I wondered if you can give like, we'll, we'll go into like, more details, but but how would you say do can partners help their partner in their career? So I think there's there's two layers, right? The one that always comes to mind is the practical layer, right? Do you help around the house? Do you share childcare and all that stuff? Now that is important. I am not denying that. It's really important. But actually what I found in my research is that is is really the icing on the cake. And in fact, in some ways, or the tip of the iceberg, and what really matters is what's underneath the iceberg, right? It's a little bit like the Titanic. So a lot of couples can have, you know, Google spreadsheets and they sync their calendars and all this sort of stuff, and they still hit the iceberg. And the reason is because the stuff that really matters is the stuff that's underneath, right? Are we having 
those conversations around how can we support each other in our careers, whose career takes priority. So I think in terms of helping, we think, okay, I can most help by doing the dishes and doing the laundry. Yes, but that's probably not the biggest thing. The biggest thing is really thinking about having those conversations about how do our careers interact? How can we negotiate those power dynamics? How can we think about how we really need to support each other? So it's kind of one level down from the practical. You structure the book around three kind of transitions. Why are, like like for, for the people who haven't yet read the book, I, I highly recommend the book. Um, but for those who you haven't, what brought you to kind of these three transitions, maybe briefly summarize the three transitions and why they are so important? Yeah, so of course, one of the problems, as you know, about doing research on people is this huge variation between people, right? And on one hand, like, how do you summarize what happens with people? But what I saw in my research, what became clear quite quickly was, of course, the details of my life are different from your life, are different from everyone else's life. But the themes and the kind of challenges we face are actually very, very similar. And what I saw happening in my research um, and of course, I studied couples across time and also couples at different career stages, kind of different career and life stages. And I saw there were three really quite predictable moments in our career span and in our relationship life where big issues arose. Now, I'm not saying that everything's plain sailing the rest of the time, but these were three really big predictable times which were very challenging. And, and I call these transitions. And the reason I call them transitions is they can go one way or the other, right? The challenge is that if we kind of face together and we move through well, can really boost our career to the next level and can really take our couple to the next level, right? Where we're feeling content with each other, we're in a good space with our family and things. Um, and so these transitions became really important. And just really briefly, the first transition is uh, regardless of where you are in your career phase, it's about your relationship phase. And it's sort of the post honeymoon transition. So if you think back to the early days of your relationship, right, everything's wonderful. The angels are singing, the birds are tweeting, <laughs> you know, everything's great. And then you hit a roadblock. And that tends to be one of two or three things. You know, for the younger couples, it's very often having children, right? Suddenly the world gets turned upside down. For those of us, maybe you don't have children who you meet in later life, it's very often something to do with careers. So let's say you get a offered a job on the other side of the world. Ooh, how do we deal with that? How do we manage kind of those obstacles? For some couples later in life, it might be around, ooh, or do we kind of mix families from previous lives or how do we deal with elder care? But it's the, but the first transition comes when we face a big consequential decision that we can no longer go at on parallel tracks. So that's the first transition. The should second transition. Yeah, you dig should, into that. Into, let's let's dig a little bit into this. Um, the um, obviously the we want to keep this intellectually interesting, but I also want to make sure that people come out with some actionable advice where they say like, okay, this is what I need to do. I'm in this phase right now. Um, so so for couples who go through this kind of first major transition, be it career wise, be it having a child maybe you know you allude to other things in the book right kind of taking care of a loved one or something like this but some major major kind of uh, roadblock you hit um what are what are things you advise couples to do in those phases yeah so let me first tell you, tell you about the big mistakes and then what you should do instead classic mistake we fall into is thinking about this as a logistics problem we need to solve okay so who earns the most money? Okay, we should go with that person's, you know, that person's job move. Like, how do we arrange our schedules? These kind of things. These are all important. But really, the question that comes up at this transition point, this first point where we need to make a choice is whose career takes priority? Now, most couples will do whatever they can to avoid tackling that question head on. Oh, no, 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 we're both equal. But then you make a decision which is clearly prioritizing one person or the other. So what I see at this transition point, the most helpful thing you can do as a couple is have a real honest conversation around, OK, what do we both want out of our careers? And at this stage in our life, what does it make sense in terms of whose career takes priority? Now, Having said that, I don't necessarily mean one person's needs to take priority forever, 
um, this idea of primary, secondary couple, although that works for some couples. For other couples, they may choose, actually, we really want to keep our, our careers on a level playing field. But then you're going to have to make some really hard choices, right? Some boundaries to support that. But having that conversation can really help couples get through this first decision point. But unfortunately, many couples kind of shy away from it. So it's really interesting. You see, like, I, I think it's a in a domain in which I study is a lot of kind of interorganizational collaborations. And there's a lot of work on like relational contracts. And it's very often basically just, you know, it's not so much about the minutiae of like a particular contract, but it's very often kind of develop like a joint understanding of the nature of the interaction and what is going to have a priority, what are kind of their goals, what are our goals and stuff like that. Um, so it's really like laying the groundwork for that is that, is that a fair summary? Absolutely. So essentially, what I find in my research, which is really interesting and exactly opposite to what Maya is saying, is it doesn't matter what couples decide. So it doesn't matter if you're priority, if I'm priority, if we're equal priority, if we agree to take turns. What matters is that we have decided it consciously. Okay, so the biggest mistake couples make, and this is the biggest reason that hits women and, and particularly new mums, is that conversation hasn't happened and couples fall into an agreement without talking it through. And particularly, this is specifically in that period where we've just had children, very oftentimes what happens in that period is we'll slip into an agreement without actually negotiating it that will really pull down women's careers. And so what I find is, and, and what I love about this finding is, it doesn't really matter what you choose, but it really matters. You're very explicit about that choice. So it's it's almost more the how than the what in that sense, or the process of actually sitting down discussing these issues is kind of crucial. You you describe uh, you describe not not one of your first date, but an early experience in in your relationship. Um, which is, by the way, um, let me kind of say this very broadly. It's a very nice way aspect about the book. We learn something about your relationship. We learn something about couples. We learn a lot about research on identities and careers. Um, we also learn quite a bit about literature. I think Charles Dickens is kind of quoted, Eric Fromm are quoted. So, so, we, so it's really like a potpourri of all kind of wonderful elements actually put together. What is this couple contracting thing you and you and your partner have engaged in? Yeah, so couple contracting is something that we've done, that I recommend other people done, which is really about making explicit what we want. And I think um, what's really important is we get away from the one size fits all. So we hear a lot, for example, about the 50-50 partnership. You know, everything needs to be 50-50. It's a wonderful ideal, but you know what? Not everyone wants that, right? And so to push people into, it has to be this or this or this. What I find very clearly in my research and what others have found in research too is what's important is it's it's contracted, right? That we both understand and have the same idea of how this works. So let me give you a little example. I was working with couples who, ha who had decided they wanted to take turns to drive their careers forward. So they didn't want 50-50 at any one moment. They wanted to sort of one put their foot on the gas and the other the other kind of put their foot on the brake a bit. That's great. It worked for them. And so they, they'd sat down, they talked about this, they'd kind of agreed they would take roughly three years and then they'd swap positions. And then they came back to me, you know, in a in a in a bit of a mess, saying, um, and and she was saying, you know, it's my turn now. And he was saying, no, 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 but that's not when we started, right? The three years started. For her, the three years started when she gave birth. For him, the three years started kind of when they'd moved to a different city. And it again shows the importance of being explicit, right? And so what this contract does, um, and I like to write, I think it's great to write these things down. And I have to say, now we have older children, my children are teenagers. We do this every year with our children and our children get in on, on the action as well, right? What does every member of the family want? How are we gonna support each other? What's the plan for the next year? It's to be as explicit as possible because very often conflict and regret and resentment in relationships stem from uncertainty. It's, I thought this, and I thought you thought that as well, but actually 
I understand you thought something different. And that's where we get the divergence, right? And it's this divergence and the uncertainty that really creates a lot of pain in couples, which spills over into our careers. You see, one thing that I, one thing that surprised me about the book is one likes to think one has a good understanding of these things, right? And so, but then one reads the book and, and one realizes after one has read it, it makes sense, but it is a little bit counterintuitive in the first sense, right? To kind of sit, you see, like, I like to think of myself, oh, I care about my partner, um, but sitting down to write a contract with my partner feels like a very different kind of animal. Um, are there other things where you would say, you see, like I'm particularly keen on stuff, what is not natural to people, but very effective. You see, if it's natural to people, you see, if sugar is good for me, don't worry about it. It's very natural for me to kind of consume lots of chocolate. But if it yeah. turns out that broccoli is very good for me, I need to know that because it's not coming naturally. So, so in I that like sense, what's What's, yeah, yeah, what's, what's that? So, so first is, is being really explicit and not assuming. I would say the second thing is asking for what you need. And I think we are actually quite poor at this in our couples. We kind of have this magical thinking that our partner should know, right? Well, he should know that this is what I need and support. And I find one exercise which is very, very powerful for couples is to get them to sit down and think of, you know, if there's two or three things you need from your partner on an ongoing basis, what is that? And, and I say, if you do this with your partner tonight, you'll be su really surprised what they come up with. You know, for some people, it's like, I just need five minutes at the end of every day where I can download my day and then I feel good about myself. You know, it's the little things. And we do this classic thing where we assume the support we want is the support our partners want. And this is a lot of where this support goes awry in couples because we don't ask for what we need. We're either shy about it or we just assume our partner should know. So this is another thing which is a little bit counterintuitive um, sort of in, in this asking for support. I think the other thing, which is really interesting, isn't it? We think as we get older, we get more mature and we're better at managing our couples. But actually, new couples are really good at doing this stuff. And we just stop doing it when life gets busy. So if you think back to when you first got together with your partner, you probably had lots of long walks or cups of tea by the fire discussing what do I want out of life and what might the next three years look like. And then we just stop doing that. And so actually our capacity to manage our couple in many ways erodes because we we go up from that deeper level of long-term thinking and get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. Like, did you pick the kids up today? Do I need to go and get the milk? I need to fly to London tomorrow. Are you going to be managing the timetable? Which is all important stuff. But unless we're tackling that deeper stuff, we're just going to keep drifting off course. Jennifer, I'm going to um, start engaging a little bit with the questions we are getting here via the Q&A. And I encourage everyone to actually kind of send, send in their questions. Um, so, so the first question I, I would like to engage with is, is Maya's question, who kind of points out that she's a little bit she's a little bit skeptical that you should actually kind of make a decision in whose um, in whose kind of career in whose kind of career has pr pr um, priority. Can can you elaborate a little bit on this? Like um, in the book, you actually write, if I recall this correctly, the couples who do best actually are the ones who decide that both careers have priority. Um, but but dig a little bit deeper into this. Yeah. Yeah. So the truth is, whether you sit down and decide it verbally or not, you you already have a decision in your couple. There is an acting, you know, you're acting a priority out, whether you've talked about it or not. So all we're talking about here is making it explicit. Right. And we really think of three models. I think the traditional model we think about, which I think if your parents were a dual career couple or your grandparents, it was. They probably had this model and it's probably your father or your grandfather was in the what we think of as the primary career and your your grandmother or your mother was in the secondary career. So this is one traditional model. You know, nowadays the gender, you know, is not so clear on that, but this is one model that can work. A second model is a turn taking model, which means at any point in time, so if we were a couple handing, you know, maybe I'm I'm primary now and you're secondary, but then we we take it in turns to swap those positions. 
that's actually quite popular these days because we have much more, much less linear careers. So, I mean, if we think of our career, right, we have times in our career where we really need to push on the gas, right? When we're coming up for tenure or people in professional services where we just have to be primary career and, and our partners need to step up. And then there are times we can step back. So this kind of modular method, this turn taking is becoming more and more popular. Entrepreneurs very often favor this as they're pushing for a startup and, and then they can take the foot off the gas, et cetera. The third model is what we think of as double primary careers. So people having their careers on an equal footing. Now on the surface, this is the most difficult to manage because you need to make some really tough decisions. Very often these might be geography. Okay, so we're both gonna push our careers, but we are agreeing we're not gonna leave Paris or London or, or something like this, because that's often where these tensions arises. Um, and when I first did the analysis of the data, I was really interested in which was most successful. And by success, just to be clear, I mean two things. One is subjectively successful. So I feel happy and successful in my career and I feel happy and successful in my, in my partnership, okay? Because we don't care really about objective success or we care is how we feel about. And when I looked across those, on the surface, it looked as if proportionally slightly more couples who had the 50-50, the, the double primary, um, looked slightly more successful than the others. But there were successful couples in the other two groups as well. So then I did a second analysis, pulling out all those successful couples and looking what's the commonality between them. And it was really straightforward. The commonality was simply that they had sat down and negotiated and explicitly agreed it. And really the reason there's slightly more couples in the double primary is it's so hard to manage. You kind of have to sit down and negotiate it, right? You have to have that explicit discussion around, you know, it's London or, or, or nothing. Um, but what, what I really love about that finding is coming back to this thing that it doesn't matter what you pick, right? It doesn't matter what you pick. It, we shouldn't be saying to couples, this is what you should be aiming for. What we should be saying to couples is lots of different things can work as long as you've really sat down and negotiated and agreed it. And then you revisit that periodically, right? I mean, if we were to agree what we wanted at, four, at 30, it's not going to be the same as what we want and what we need at 50. So it's important we revisit that, but it needs to be a kind of stake in the ground. So making things explicit. Um, Jennifer, you have, um, the book is research-based. You have kind of referred multiple times to, to the analysis. Um, there was there was interest by by um, by Thomas. Um, yeah. What is kind of the what is kind of the basis? Maybe you can say a little bit about kind of the underlying process. The findings are fascinating, um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about the process that led to these findings. Yeah. So this is based on what we call qualitative research. So it's sort of interview based with couples, um, interviewing, which is quite fun as a researcher, interviewing the partners separately and then sort of looking at their narratives compared to each other. And just in terms of the sample, so this is a global sample from sort of every continent, not Antarctica, but everywhere else, um, and a real range of couples. So I sampled to go from sort of new couples in their late twenties, right through to retirees. So across the age span, also sampled across different industries. So from professional services to industry, to not-for-profit, to government, you know, really right across the board. And also a big mix of couples. So, you know, straight couples, gay couples, big age gap, small age gap, you know, different nationalities, same nationalities, sort of really tried to get as much variance as possible. So, and the reason we do that from a research perspective is then when we see patterns, we can be more confident that they are sort of universal patterns as opposed to, oh, it's just French couples who do this. So that's why we're sampling for that diversity. The so one one thing you alluded to and and one of our participants has has immediately um, um, Joris immediately kind of jumped onto this. You include your children in this, um, so so you are doing so in, in some ways. Um, I think the the title of the book is fantastic, but I often thought like families that work are also would also have been an alternative title for it because in many ways it's really to get the family work as a whole. Um, the how do you include your children in this kind of contracting and whatever you're going to say now i'm going to subject my children to tonight so 
Be your children careful. might be a little young, Henning. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I can tell you personally, but I know a lot of other couples do this. So this also sort of came out of the research and was something we started as a result of the research. So I think, um, and there's actually some fascinating research uh, out recently about the effects of talking to your children about your work. And now we're talking children probably eight, nine onwards. We're not talking, you know, three or four, five-year-olds. They can understand a little bit, but I'm talking sort of, let's say eight or nine plus. Um, let me talk about that research and then come back to how you do this. So the research shows there's actually incredible benefits for your career by talking to your kids about your career because you get this sense of alignment, right? That they get it and stuff. So, but how do you include the, the children in this? So I'll tell you what I do and I'll tell you what other couples do. So we have this ritual on New Year's Eve that we are, and my kids are 15 and 14 now, but we've done this, I think for seven years now, um, where we sit down and we, we, we do, first we do a review of the year and we give things stars, five to one star, right? What were the experiences and stuff? And then we sit down and we talk about our aims for the year for all of us and how do we need to support each other? So this year, my kids are, you know, facing the kind of exams to, to get into university. So that was a big thing. I am writing a second book and we sort of talked about the help I need with that. So we really include them in terms of what are our goals? How do we need to support each other? And also what are some of the sacrifices we need to make, right? If you want to do this, that means that I may not be able to do all the things I want to do. And, and certainly in my experience, and there are a lot of couples in my research talked about this as well, kids from eight, nine, 10 can really, first of all, they enjoy this, right? Being part of the family and part of understanding what's important to each other. Um, but also they, they get it, right? They really understand that this is important and this is them. So I very much encourage you to have these have these conversations with your children and share the dilemmas, right? I think sometimes we shield children too much, share the dilemmas, you know, if you really want to do this, I am going to have to do a little bit less of that. And that's okay if we agree together, but it's not okay if we don't agree together because that's when we're going to get the resentment. The um we have we have plenty of discussion, we have plenty of we have plenty of, of questions. One thing that that I've actually been doing some research on recently, so I'm very curious in your thoughts, it's, it's the same question that that Sola has. Um any wisdom for couples who co-direct the same business? So you see, like it can happen that the you are a couple in your personal life, um, but then you also might actually be like in this in the same business. Your own relationship is an example of that. You have some in the book where, for example, I think there's a couple who works in the same semiconductor, both work in the semiconductor industry in Germany, if I recall this yeah. correctly, and happens to be the same company. So, so what are particularities? I know it's not the focus of the book, but in particular, like on people with an entrepreneurial background very often have this that yeah. Partners have a role in the business. Any any thoughts on this? These are what what is very yeah, so, multiple so, relation. Yeah. So first of all, Susanna, it's not unusual, right? Most of us meet our partners at work, <laughs> so this is not unusual at all. And whether it's kind of an entrepreneurial direct in the same business, or whether it's working in the same business school or in the same organization, and very often over time, so some of the older couples I look at in the book their careers have sort of gone like this, right? Where there's periods they work together and then they maybe go off and then they come back together. And especially as couples get older, so I'm knocking on 50, you know, as couples get into their 50s and things, a lot of couples come together and, and do something, whether that's something on the side or together. So I think it can be fun and it has its challenges, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and I think the main challenge, and this sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it's very easy to lose your couple when you're together all the time. And we actually saw this a little bit in lockdown, you know, when we were all at home in our pajamas on Zoom all the time. And if we think about a couple, just as it, at its real essence, what brings a couple and keeps a couple together, it's desire, right? I, you know, there's this wonderful um, Netflix documentary on David Beckham at the moment. I'm a big David Beckham fan. And there's this lovely scene where they're being interviewed. And there was like, you know, and he said, I just fancied her, <laughs> right? And there needs to be that spark in a couple. And the thing that's really counterintuitive is when you spend a lot of time in close proximity, that spark can go. Because if you think about that spark, it's very often, you know, you see your partner across a room or, you know, talking to someone else and you're like, mm, 
Um, and, and the biggest danger with that working together all the time is you lose that essence of the kind of chemistry in the couple. So I still think it's really important when you do that to think about how do we keep the couple, you know, the pure coupleness alive when we're together all the time, facing challenging stuff and sort of in the trenches together. Does that answer the question, Henning? Um, I should, um, I shouldn't be the person who answers that, but the participant who asked. But the um, so, so, so don't hesitate to follow up with, with another question in the Q and A. One one thing I wondered about when when reading the book, and and there, we have two questions on this. Um, Linda and and Joel asking about this. Um, you see, it starts more. It starts being more common that women are the main bread earner in in a couple, right? Um, but sometimes, because society still is as it is, this can in an odd way actually be harder for the men, right? Um, to uh, I remember there's a Danish study, for example, which shows that the demand for Riago goes up the moment the, the women actually earns more in a relationship. So yeah. there's like self-confidence issues and stuff like that. So, so I wonder if you have any hints on how men can play the supporting role without kind of getting like snarky remarks at their job or their personal lives or stuff like that. And you see, like, I'm not saying this, be, I'm not saying this, like, let's help out the man here, but in a, in, a, in a certain way, we need to solve this problem for men to actually make sure that women thrive. Yeah, it's a really good question. And before I answer it, I want to say we see big generational effects here. So what we see is, and I'm going to make a very sweeping statement now, obviously it depends culturally as well, but we see in the under 40s, this is a lot, it's still an issue, but it's less of an issue. So we see that social, that gender socialization stronger, because if we think to, let's think of our fathers, for example, my father's in his late 70s, you know, when he was growing up, the gender stereotypes were very, very strong and they, they're progressively loosening. So I do want to be clear that it's a little bit different depending on the generation you, we're talking about. But in terms of in terms of man, there's really two layers going on here. One is the societal pushback. And the reality is in almost all of our societies, even, you know, when we think about Denmark and, or Sweden that are really kind of held up to be the kind of paragons of virtue on this, there are a lot of subtle slights towards couples who inverse the traditional gender roles. And that's both to men and women. So women will often get the, you know, who looks after your children and all these kind of remarks. And men will get the kind of, you've lost your manhood, essentially, kind of remarks. So it's a lot of strength in a couple to deal with both sides of that kind of inverse, inverse polarity. Um, and this is why it's really important that we're strong as a couple so we can sort of deal with that outwards. But I often think in these things, it's the little things that really matter. For example, you know, the classic thing, who does the school call when, you know, when the child is sick, right? Um, all these things being clear about people, you know, this is the way we've split the roles and please call my husband or please call my wife if this happens. So really being clear in that communication, because I think it's easy to get annoyed with people, but I think we have to accept that people will default to stereotypes. We don't want that, but they will. And so I think there's a lot of ways we can just very subtly sort of educate people that, OK, if this happens. This is the one of us to call or, you know, try and be consistent in this way. And, and one of the things we see when we look at that real practical level of managing couples, and there's some great work coming out of Harvard Business School actually on this, which is looking at what is the best way to divide those administrative tasks, if I can put it like that. And it's becoming clear that we should never ever share tasks. We should always divide. What does that mean, right? You are responsible for, I don't know, everything to do with booking the holidays, and that's just your job, and I butt out. Now, when it comes to gender things like childcare, um, this is really helpful for communication tools. So, for example, in, in my family, my husband's uh, originally a medic, so anything dental health is him, right? So the school knows to call him, the doctor knows to call him, the vaccine, everything's him. Everything social life is me. I'm a kind of social butterfly, right? So dividing like this can really help these gendered roles because people get a handle on 
sort of what's yours and what's mine. But if we share, the default is I'm going to call them mum, for example. So this is one way we can help help the system. Got it. The um, there was one question by um, by Lara that I that I found quite beautiful. Um, she she pointed out um, the double primary sometimes fields end up like a double secondary, which which I thought was a very nice formulation. <laughs> um, how how do you avoid that? That the the goal for making both partners' career priority ends up feels like making none of them a priority. Yeah, this is uh, we have all been there, Lara. Right. Um. So. First of all, just a slightly aside, there are some couples who are choosing double secondary. And, and we saw this after the pandemic, right? Both of them are choosing to pull back on work. So that's just an aside. But but what if you want double primary? I, I just think, I remember someone saying to me when I had small children, which may, maybe you have at the moment, Lara, is like the, you know, the days are long, but the years are short. And I do think that's right. I think it, it is real, that there are certain periods where hard as hard as we may push, there's only so far we can go. And you know what? That that's what life is like, right? But actually, that period passes relatively quickly if we think of our career span. So one of the things we're facing now is the first time ever, really, where we're facing a 50 plus year career span, right? If you imagine you get a you started, I got my first job at 22. The likelihood I'm in employment till 72 is, is fairly large, right? So this is a 50-year career span. So proportionally, that period of really intense child rearing is actually quite a small portion of it, small a smaller portion than we've ever seen before. So if we look at women's careers, just as an example, the Forbes list of 100 most powerful women came out a couple of weeks ago. More than 50% were women over 50 OK, and I think something like 30 percent were women over 60. And so what we're seeing are people's careers are just peaking a little later than than they were. But when we look over the long time, as long as you don't stop your career, as long as you keep going, you actually do. The, the data shows you catch up rather quickly. I know it doesn't feel like that in the moment, but that's certainly what the research shows that, you know, if you look in in a one year time period, you can feel as if you're running through treacle. But if, if you look to a five to seven year time period, the hit on your career is a lot less than you might think. The uh, one thing I wondered about, be, and then I want to move on to the second kind of transition. We are we're still in the first transition. But a little bit kind of piggybacking on um, the wonderful Victoria Zazara, for example, who I had the pleasure of a student a few years ago, um, ask a fantastic question. And she's she's very interested in kind of, how should I say, um, in, in diversity within the sample to a certain degree. So, so she's asking here about the most important parameters, um, geography, childcare, workouts, career progression, compensation. Um, I wonder if you can, what are kind of the key things that typically pop up? Like you had mentioned geography is an important one. Yeah. Um, so, what, what, what else? Yeah, so when I think about having this, um, this kind of contracting conversation, a big piece of it is boundaries, right? And defining what is the field we're playing on? Because we're all playing on slightly different fields. So if I think about those boundaries, for me, there's three big ticket items. One, and I think this is hyper relevant for an INSEAD audience, is geography what is in and what is out and one of the biggest bones of contention is oh I just got offered this great job in Miami and my, my Miami I could never get a job in Miami right so having a, a sense of what's in and what's out before the job opportunity comes up is really important so that's the first one geography um the second set of boundaries are a little bit a little bit about work hours plus work travel now let's not be belligerent, you know, there's always weeks where we just have to go for it, right? But on average, how much work is too much work and how much travel is too much travel? Like between the two of you, how can you manage that? That's the second big piece, which is really important. And the reason it's worth specifying that is of course we all have weeks where we go over, but it's a little bit like the canary in the mine, right? If we have next week we go over and the week after and the week after, brrr, you know, the alarm bell starts ringing. 
And the third area is not something Victoria had down, but it's actually our extended family. So this can be a real, real pain point for couples. And one of the biggest points of tension is what is the boundary between our couple or our nuclear family and our extended families? You know, where do we spend our holidays when it's Christmas or New Year or Ramadan or whatever? Who's where? Like, where where do we go for these big festivals? That is the third boundary, which is the biggest kind of pain point um, in terms of in terms of this thing. And then, yes, kind of the childcare and all that sort of thing we layer on top. But those the child care and, and things are, are things which shift over time. But the geography, the like the travel and things tend to be a bit more kind of stable in terms of what we can manage, where we want to be um, and what's going to work for us as a couple. I want to I want to echo a question by Anish, but I, I'll, for, I'll reformulate a little bit. He, he asked if there's going to be a recording available because he wants to share it with with his partner. With um, but the the thing I was I was wondering about to a certain degree, right? Like, let's say I've read your book, I really like it. I'm I'm committed to get it to work this way in exactly the way you suggest. Um, but my partner's just not up for it. So how you see, like I, I mean, I can obviously give my partner your book, um, which I have done, by the way. Um, I I don't think there's there's a book I've given more often as a present than than your <laughs> book. Um, the but but what is something how how should i say you see like you, you're suggesting a certain process here right and you see like in a certain degree as i read the book you try to convince me and in my case very successfully that i adopt this kind of process but that's only half of the thing right i also need to convince my partner to engage in that process yeah. how, how do i do that yeah, it's a great question. I get it all the time. So first of all, I think a lot of us assume our partners are more resistant than they are. That's the first thing I want to say. I get plenty of people saying, like, men would never do this. Not true. Or like, my, I can never get my partner to have a conversation. Mm. So what I go through in the book is a really layering up. I think the worst thing you can do is sort of go home tonight and say, okay, we need to talk about like these 20 things and it needs to be tonight and we're going to get out a paper, a piece of paper, map it all out. That's not going to go down very well. right? So what I talk about in the book is really layering these conversations. And if I think about the absolute foundation conversation, which I bet everyone's partner is up for, it's really just a conversation where you don't need to agree anything. You don't need to negotiate anything. It's just a conversation of what do you want out of the next five years? Where would what if if we get to. Um, you know, 2029, 20, well, that sounds scary. And we look back, how do we know this five years has been good? And that conversation, it's just a conversation of understanding. And it's a wonderful conversation to have, actually. And it's not about, okay, in two years and six months, I'm going to plan this on an Excel spreadsheet. It's really about what are those big ticket items. So when I look back, you know, five or six years ago, for us as a family, when we had that conversation, one of the things for me was, I really want to write this book, right? That, that was one of my big ticket items. You know, our parents are getting quite elderly. We wanted to spend more time with them. There were a couple of big trips we wanted to have with the kids while they still thought we were cool and they liked us. Um, you know, we're talking about big ticket items. And just that baseline conversation can really open a level of understanding where you start thinking about, okay, if you want that and I want this, how are we going to start making this work? So I think it's about taking these little baby steps and starting to build a common understanding before you try and negotiate and get the map of the world out or kind of talk about all these boundaries. So it's really about building up an understanding. And what I find is as you build that understanding, a lot of choices become obvious right? It's almost as if you don't need to negotiate them anymore. Well, if you want this in your career and I want that, it's very clear we need to stay in this geography, right? Okay. Agreement off the table. This is very clear. So I think starting from that conversation with, you know, a glass of wine, a cup of tea, I'm very British, um, very non-threatening. It is, Jennifer, in quite a few ways, a negotiation book, isn't it? In many ways it is. So if you think of and if, for those of you who did the INSEAD MBA, if you think of, um, you know, decision making theory, classic decision making theory is you should never, ever 
coach a decision unless you've already set the criteria. And you should always set the criteria before you have the options on the table. I mean, you did this 101 decision-making class. It's exactly the same in our couples, but the number of times we don't do that the number of times we wait, oh, I'm just going to wait and see if the job comes through and then say, oh, by the way, Heading, I got this great opportunity in Japan. We're off next month. Like, what? It's mm. unbelievable. And so really, yeah, it is. The, Jennifer, I would love to move to the second, to the second transition. Um, yeah. What's the second transition about? It's where we are, dear. <laughs> so the second <laughs> transition for everyone sort of, it, it, it's really based on, I suppose, what we might classically call the midlife crisis. So we know from thousands of studies that when we tend get to somewhere in our mid 40s, early to mid, mid late 40s, most of us tend to have a point where we sit back and really think, is this it, right? Is this what I want? You know, we've been working really hard through our 20s and 30s to establish ourselves, to establish our careers. Hopefully we've been successful to some measure. And then, you know, and I'm sure many of you on this call identify with this, you get to this moment and think, mm, I'm, like, is this it for the rest of my life? Do I carry on? So it's this big moment of questioning is this really what I want? And it's a moment of reorientation. And of course, in a couple, assuming you are roughly the same age, like 10 year age gap or less, it's very likely you're doing this at the same time. And it can be a very destabilizing time for couples. And it's not a surprise that when we look at the divorce rate, this is a period where the divorce rate really peaks this kind of time of life, because it's a time of life where we're really re-questioning anything. And this is the time of life where this capacity to support each other in our couples comes to the fore. Now, what do I mean by support, right? We often think of support in the very British way. I'll make you a cup of tea and give you a biscuit. It's lovely. I like a cup of tea. <laughs> but the support that works best at this time in our couples is a little bit less of that and a little bit more of the friendly kick, right? This, this kick to, okay, well, what are you gonna do about this? Because where the resentment builds up, both in our career and our couples at, the, at this stage is when we feel like, I just gotta keep going. I'm just gonna keep going until the kids leave home. I mean, we tell ourselves all sort of stories. I, I just gotta keep going until, you know, insert the excuse. Um, and that's when the trouble starts. So it's really about, do we have the strength in our couple to sit you know take a step back together and think about how are we going to reassess this how are we going to reorient now I think the the sort of fantasy we have at that stage is oh our partner's going to throw in the towel and do something completely different maybe but what we see from the research is for most people it's not a huge transition in what they do but it tends to be quite a big transition in their approach to the work, right? In their approach to their career and their approach to their couple. And so this is a time when we really need to have the strength to have those conversations and help each other through this time of questioning. So it's, so one's personal career and the, the couple is, is very, very intertwined, right? And so, so I'm hitting this step where I kind of try to make sense out of, okay, what's gonna be next for me? Or my partner hits the time and okay, what's going to be next for him or her? Um, how can the partner be most supportive and helpful in his or her partner's life in that phase? Yeah, well, one of the great things about being in a dual career couple is your partner gets it to a certain extent, right? They understand the world of work and things. So I really think there's three big roles at that time. And, and certainly something you should not do. So the, the thing you should not do <laughs> to start with is meddle, right? Uh, you know, it really needs to be a more hands-off approach, right? Have you done this? Have you checked up with this person? Have you looked at this job advert? But the three really golden things are, one is be that sounding board. And I think it's incredibly difficult to really listen to someone. We all think we're good listeners. Most of us are terrible. OK, so can I really just sit down and focus on my partner and just be a, a mirror, a sounding board, like as someone to talk to, 
to really give them the space to talk these th things through without interrupting, without suggesting ideas, without looking at your phone, without, you know, doing something else. And I think one of the reasons we don't do that is we're so easily distracted these days. And secondly, we think we have, we feel like, oh, when am I going to have the time for that? Do we need to book a weekend away? But I remember when I taught the MBAs many years ago, I used to do this exercise in class where I would get pairs of students to listen to each other for two minutes, two minutes. And I would just time two minutes and they weren't allowed to interrupt. They weren't allowed to say anything. They weren't allowed to check their phone. And even in two minutes, it's incredible the amount of information you can transfer if you're talking, the amount of information you can take in if you're listening, and the feeling of being heard and listened to afterwards, which is what people are really looking for in this step. So just in, investing two or three minutes of like total focused attention goes a long way. The second thing is, is pushing your partner to stay with the questions. I think very often many of us are paid in our jobs to solve problems, right? There's an issue, I'm going to solve it, move on. But these questions are big questions and they're not questions that can be solved immediately. And in fact, very often when we solve them immediately, we get to the wrong, wrong answer, right? They're questions that just need you need to sit with. I mean, you'll know this, Henning, it's like when you're trying to solve a research project problem, sometimes you just need to sit with the, with the data and the questions for a while before you get there. So the second thing is really, can you encourage your partner to sit and work this through before sort of jumping ship? And then the third piece is sharing kind of your worries about this. It's really hard to say, you know, I, I'm worried like you're going to have the classic midlife crisis affair and, and wander off. But it's really important we air that stuff so our partner can hear us. Jennifer, how do I, so, so now we've kind of talked about what I can do to support my partner. What can I do if my partner doesn't support me? So how do I, you see, like, how do I, re, how do I request this support in a, in a constructive manner? Yeah, it's a great question. So first of all, I think this is something none of us are very good at. And, and I think it's one of the most helpful things you can do. And I actually think most of our partners will thank us for us, thank us for it. So I think first of all is to really spend some time on your own thinking about what are the two or three big ticket items I need for my partner. I mean, going with a laundry list of 20 things is, is maybe a little bit much, but if there were two or three things I need from my partner every week, what are they? It might be around moral support. It might be listening. It might be you just want one night a week where you don't have to do anything with the kids. You can go out with your friends. It, you know, it could be all sorts of things and, and going and saying, look, I've been thinking about this. These are the few, two or three things I would really like from you every week. Your partner will probably jump for joy because for most of us, we're kind of stabbing around in the dark, right? I want to be supportive. I do this, but then I'm not thanked. I do that and I don't get it. And so to know, okay, my partner needs these two or three things. And they are going to be grateful when I give them. That's important too. Solves all my problems in my couple, right? Because I know what to do. I know I'm going to get thanked for it. And I'm going to get gratitude. Everyone's happy. But it requires a little bit of thinking on your part beforehand. Because a lot of people just go to their couples and their partners and say, you're not supporting me. Well, what does that mean, right? What does that support look like? So to get a genuine ask around these are the two or three things I need, most partners are delighted when their partner goes and asks that of them. Say a word about the third transition, Jennifer, and I'm particularly interested because <clears throat> having a bit of an engineering background, um, it's always helpful to think from the end towards the beginning. Um, <laughs> so so I, I, I think having an understanding of the third transition actually helps you to manage the first and the second. So, so can you say a word about the third yeah, so the third transition comes later on in our careers. So probably, um, you know, age-wise, we're talking in our 50s and beyond. And it's a stage where even for the most high potential of us, at some point our careers plateau, right? Even if you're CEO, right, your career is going to plateau at some point. And this is a time when we 
our priorities tend to change. So when we're in our 20s, 30s, 40s, we tend to be really invested in upward trajectory and kind of our success and our growth and our development, which is great. When we get a little bit later in our careers, we start to be concerned with legacy, right? And these questions are passing on to the next generation, mentoring people, become a lot more salient than they were early in our, earlier, earlier in our careers. And what I find is it's a really generative time for couples, this kind of later career phase where there's a transition and, and a number of things that tend to be happening at one time. If couples have had children, they tend to be flying the nest. So there's a lot more freedom. You know, you're getting your freedom back. You're back to that honeymoon period. I'm three years away. I'm very excited. Um, and then you're also, you know, you feel you've achieved maybe what you wanted to, maybe not quite what you wanted to, but you know, your career is plateauing. So there's a broadening out of horizons again. And this is a time when what we're seeing more and more frequently now is couples are starting to develop these portfolio careers. So maybe they keep on their own job, but maybe they do something together on the side. Maybe they do some volunteering, not-for-profit boards, all of these things. So it's a time where we see a lot of rejuvenation in the couple themselves, but also a lot of career rejuvenation. rejuvenation. And obviously these two things are connected. So it's quite an exciting transition in terms of possibilities for the future. Jennifer, we, we start hitting the, the end of the podcast. Any kind of final thoughts you want to share? Things you feel like we have not sufficiently emphasized? Things you have learned since writing the book? Um, so I, I maybe want to say just a little bit about cultural differences. Because that's Wonderful. the question that comes up, it comes up a lot. Sort of cultural differences and gender stereotypes. So I often think, I have my analogy is always like you have a couple and it's like a pot on a, on a, if you imagine those old gas cookers, you know, where you turn the dial and the gas flares up. And I often think there's two really key dials. One is um, extended family and one is the gender culture in, in your, in your, um, in your country. And, and what we find is if we take kind of the extremes, the, the Denmark, the Sweden, the Norway, obviously the gas is turned way down on the gender stereotyping. It's still there, but it's a lot lower than let's say Italy or, or a Southern European country. However, the thing that these countries don't have is the support network. So when we think, particularly when we're raising couples, that notion of the extended network, which for example, in Southern European cultures, Middle Eastern cultures are really great at this, right? There's a network of aunts and uncles and sisters and things who can step in and help the family. So if we look at the nuclear family, I think particularly in the West, we've really gone to this idea of the nuclear family. And it's very, very difficult for a working, working couple when we're really nuclear. So one of the last things I would say, if you're not in that culture where you have your granny living next door and you know this extended network, one of the most important things you can do is try and recreate it to turn that dial down. Because if you're in a situation where you're sort of the pioneers, the nuclear family, it's incredibly difficult to make all this work. Jennifer, we, we are at the end of the hour. Um, I'm sure I just checked on Amazon.com. There are three more copies of your book available, but they say they will restock it. So everyone, everybody can now rush to various Amazon sites in various countries and buy couples that work from Jennifer Petulary. Um, I would be very happy. We're going to have another of these webinars by the end of the month. Um, it's with Bob Sutton. Um, it's very difficult to overemphasize how amazing Bob Sutton is. I think he's on his, I don't know if he has more than 10 books. I wouldn't be surprised. He's a tenured chaired professor at Stanford University. Um, he's going to talk about his new book, The Friction Project. Um, I had a chance already to look. Um, it's amazing. His books have won multiple ones. So I very much hope you join in. If you're an inside alumni, you will get the newsletter. Um, you can also follow me on LinkedIn. There are 400,000 thought leaders, but only one Henning Pizunka on LinkedIn. So please feel free to kind of follow <laughs> me there and I'll keep you posted. Otherwise, um, as always, please, please, please take care of yourself. And if you can take care of somebody else. Thank you so much. Bye.